Hey everybody, Smart Silver Stacker here. In today's video, I want to do something that I haven't done in a while, and that is provide some information for new gold and silver stackers. For anybody who is just getting into investing in precious metals. Now, this video isn't meant to be a comprehensive overview or anything like that, but what I am going to try and do is just provide as much information as I can that I think will be relevant to anybody who is thinking of purchasing some precious metals. And if you're a seasoned stacker, if you've been watching the channel for a while, you might want to stick around too because some of this stuff might be interesting to you. But if you're new to stacking and you're thinking about maybe making your first purchase or you just started stacking up some gold and silver, definitely stick around for this one because I think one of the most important things you can do as a precious metal stacker is educate yourself on the topic. Now, I wouldn't label myself an expert by any means, but I have been doing this for a while and uh, I want to share with you some of the knowledge, some of the information that I've gained in my experience as a gold and silver stacker. Now, today's video is brought to you by SD Bullion. They're my preferred source for gold and silver. You can check them out with the link down in the description, but don't go yet because we're going to talk more about buying gold and silver and what to look out for in just a moment. And Today, let's start off with just some of the history of gold and silver. And oh, by the way, definitely stick around to the end of this video if you're new, because at the end, I'm going to give you a list of tips that are sort of consolidated information that I wish someone had shared with me before I started stacking. But first, let's start off with some of the history of precious metals and just what are precious metals in general? What are we talking about when we use the word precious metals, the words precious metals? Well, the two big ones are gold and silver. But there are some other things too that you might lump into the category of precious metals. Notably, you've got platinum. It's a little bit more obscure than gold and silver. And then also palladium, which is a platinum group metal. Now, I don't own any palladium bullion, but it is definitely considered a precious metal. And then also, there are some even slightly more obscure things like perhaps rhodium. That's another platinum group metal. Um, it's a lot more valuable than any of the stuff you're looking at here, uh, but very rare as well. I don't know too many folks who stack rhodium. But anyway, uh, gold and silver really are the big ones, and that's because they're the ones that have the history of being money throughout human history. Uh, for thousands of years, gold and silver have been used as a unit of exchange, as a currency. And this goes back to, we're talking maybe 1500 BCE, uh, they've found caches of pieces of silver. Now, not minted into coins or anything like that, but in little pieces of silver, you'd have your scale and you'd weigh this stuff out and you'd use it as a means of exchange. And I believe the unit was the shekel back in the Middle East, and that was actually a unit of weight that was uh, related to silver, and that was the unit of exchange there. And then, really, there was a revolution in gold and silver in about the 6th century BCE in the kingdom of Lydia, they started out minting coins out of electrum, which is a naturally occurring alloy of gold and silver. And then this guy, King Cretius, he figured out that if you purify the gold and silver and you standardize the weight of coins, it's really good for your economy in the ancient world. And so the Lydians did that, and that was kind of a revolution in monetary history for humankind. And it facilitated a lot of trade, you know, having a standardized unit of currency in the form of precious metals. Uh, certainly that made being a merchant back then a lot easier. And gold and silver have been money ever since. Let's talk just briefly about the more recent history. So uh, you've heard probably that the dollar used to be backed by gold. In fact, it was backed up partially by gold up until 1971 when President Richard Nixon ended the convertibility of the dollar into gold. And that was pretty much when we embarked on the current system where, you know, we've got fiat currencies just backed up by government uh, promises. But before 1971, uh, in one form or another, a lot of the world was on a gold standard. In the 19th century, that's really when the gold standard was widely adopted. But before then, for most of human history, it was actually silver that was the main currency. Because the thing about gold is, you know, it's a very dense form of wealth. It's very scarce, scarcer than silver. I believe the ratio in the Earth's crust is something like 1 to 7 or 1 to 8. So, you know, there's more silver out there. And uh, so silver, really, for most of human history, this stuff was the primary currency for day-to-day -day use and for your average person. Uh, you know, 
Venetian merchants and stuff like that would use gold to settle large expenses and large uh, transactions. But for the most part, your everyday person was using silver coinage as their money. And so, you know, I tend to prefer silver myself. I'm smart silver stacker after all. And uh, silver really is the money of the people. You know, it's hard currency and it has been for a very, very long time. Now let's talk about some of the different types of silver and gold bullion that you might end up stacking because this is a really important thing to pay attention to for new stackers because this is one of the things that can be kind of overwhelming. I mean, there are a lot of different products out there. So I'm just going to try to go through and give you a very broad overview and drop a lot of information on you right now. Let's start out with gold, just to get that one out of the way. So gold, you're going to have stuff like this pre-1933 gold. This is an old U.S. coin. Uh, the modern bullion will be things like your eagles. Now, I don't have a ton of gold to show you, honestly, because like I said, my stack primarily consists of silver. But this is a, a one-tenth ounce gold eagle coin. The gold eagle is the official gold bullion coin of the United States. There's also a gold buffaloes out there. And then you've also got things like this generic gold bar. This is a really great type of product, I think, because this is where you're typically going to find the lowest premiums. And we're going to talk more about premiums here in just a moment, because it's a very important consideration uh, when stacking precious metals. And then you've got things like this uh, gold back note. So this is a laminated piece of gold. It's got a polymer on each side. It's like a very thin gold foil. It's made of 24 karat gold. And each one of these contains one one thousandth of a troy ounce. So this is like hyper fractional gold. Now let's talk about premiums before we get into silver bullion products, uh, because the, the premium thing is pretty much the same across the board for gold and silver. And the general rule is that the larger the product you get, the more uh, precious metal in a specific uh, unit of bullion. So this is, for example, a 10 gram bar compared to, say, a 1 1,000th troy ounce note like this gold back. The premium in general is going to be lower on a product that is heavier. And then the same goes as you go up in scale. You know, a kilo gold bar is going to have probably the lowest premium of all, but, you know, you're going to be paying like north of $50,000 for it. Now, the reason that premiums are higher on smaller products is because a lot of the manufacturers, the folks who are making this stuff, there's a fixed cost involved with each unit. So, you know, whether it's a kilogram gold bar, a 10 gram gold bar, it's going to be the same cost to produce that bar. So that gets passed on to the user. So, you know, with like a one tenth ounce gold coin, for example, if you want to make an ounce of these, so 10 of these, it's going to cost you about 10 times as much as it would cost to mint a single one ounce coin. And so that's why the premiums on smaller bullion products are higher. Now, every now and then you can find a deal. I mean, I think I bought this one as part of like a at spot deal that a bullion dealer was having at some point. But as a general rule, you don't want to get eaten up by premiums. So with gold products myself, I'd probably stay away from things like the one tenth ounce gold coin, maybe stick to like a one quarter ounce or larger just to avoid paying the real high premiums. Gold backs are a little bit of a different story. I mean, with these things, you're paying almost twice the spot price of gold for them. But the thing is, you can kind of sell them for that price back. So you're not really losing anything with it. But obviously, when you're, you know, making a thousand of these for every like one coin that you would have a one ounce coin, uh, the premiums on these are going to be much higher. So that's important to keep in mind. And let's go transition to silver here, uh, because this is really more my wheelhouse. And the same thing goes with silver products. Uh, typically, you're going to pay a higher premium for smaller products. Like, for example, this one tenth ounce silver round. I mean, I would stay away from these as a general rule because the premiums you're going to be paying on them are very high. If you do want some fractional silver, like some tiny silver coins, something like uh, silver half dollars, dimes, and quarters that were minted before 1964 are going to be probably more what you want to look at. Those are made of 90% silver. It's actual old coinage that circulated in the U.S. back in a time when our coinage had real metal in it, real precious metals, not just copper like today. And then also something you have to pay attention to with premiums with silver is the individual bullion products. So for example, this is a U.S. Silver Eagle. This is a one ounce coin. This is the official silver bullion coin of the United States. And the premiums on these lately 
have been exorbitant. You know, I would avoid stacking these at the moment. Even though the premiums have come down recently, they're still high relative to other forms of bullion that you might get. And let's talk real quick about the distinction between a coin and other things. So these are both round one ounce pieces of silver, but one of them was made by a government mint. This one was made by the U.S. mint. This one was made by Sunshine Silver, so a private mint. So this is actually not considered a coin, believe it or not. This is a coin. This is a round. And the only thing that can really be called a coin is something that is made by a government mint. Now, it doesn't have to be the U.S. mint. could be the Canadian mint, for example, making uh, these Canadian maple leaves. And, and there's a lot of silver coins out there. You've got uh, Austrian Philharmonics. You've got South African Krugerands. You've got Silver Britannias. Uh, but the big thing is that they have to be made by a government mint. And typically, coins, not always, but a lot of times they'll have an effigy of, uh, you know, a ruler on them or something like that. Or in the case of the U.S. mint coins, you've got Lady Liberty. And they don't always have to be one-ounce coins. They can be uh, two ounces, for example, like this two-ounce Canadian Kraken coin. But this is still legal tender. It's made by a national mint. And, and that's also something we can talk about briefly. A lot of these coins that are made by government mints, they do have an official face value. For example, the one ounce Canadian maple leaf has a $5 face value. This two ounce Kraken has a $10 face value. But really, it's just kind of a uh, nod toward the old days when the coins actually, you know, had a face value and were used as such, you know, like these uh, silver dollars, which actually circulated. This is a $1 coin, but the value that they put on coins these days, I mean, I don't know why they do it just for tradition, I guess, because, um, you know, obviously you don't want to go out and spend your maple leaf for $5 because it's got, you know, $25 worth of silver in it or something like that. So anyway, that is the difference between a coin and a round. And also, you know, these junk silver coins, these are coins too, because these were made by the U.S. Mint. Now, they weren't meant as a bullion investment, like the Silver Eagle and the Maple Leaf. They were actually meant to circulate, but you would still call those coins. Okay, so you've got coins, you've got rounds. Another thing that you have is bars. Bars are very popular among silver stackers and silver investors. I myself happen to like bars quite a bit. And uh, those come in all shapes and sizes. Oh, and as a quick aside, rounds also come in all shapes and sizes. So you've got like this five ounce round here. This is made by the Golden State Mint. It's an Aztec calendar round and it's five ounces. So it's, you know, it's big. But um, again, it's not made by a government mint. So it is considered a round. Now back to the bars. So um, bars come in all shapes and sizes. You've got everything from like little fractional bars to... Uh, one ounce bars are popular. Then you've got 10 ounces, kilos. Uh, this is a 100 ounce angle hard bar. And they go all the way up to about a thousand ounce Comex bar. And you can probably find some bars even bigger than that. But this one right here, this 100 ounce bar, this is about the biggest size that I would go to for your average retail investor. You know, I would not purchase a 1,000 ounce Comex bar, unless you have some kind of special plans for it, like you're going to slice it up or something like that. I know some folks have done that, but uh, as a general rule, I would stick to the smaller size bars. Even 100 ounce is kind of a lot for me. Um, one of the advantages of the big bars is that you do get the low premiums, like I was saying. Uh, you know, and, and What are premiums? I don't even think I've touched on that yet, but premiums are the price that you pay for your gold or your silver over the spot price. And we'll get into what the spot price is in just a minute because it's probably not what you think. Um, but let's talk real quick just about some of the other forms of silver bullion you can find. So the bars, they come in all shapes and sizes. Really the big thing here is that if you get the big bars, you're gonna get more for your money because the premiums will be lower. So you'll get actually more physical metal for the same amount of money. But the downside there is that, you know, they're not as divisible. Like, say, you know, I don't know, society falls apart and you're out shopping with your silver at the local uh, Mad Max barter post or something like that. It's going to be a lot easier to swap a one-ounce silver round for, uh, you know, a tin of spam or whatever. And I'm kind of being facetious here, guys. I'm kind of kidding around. But there is something to this. Than it is to, uh, you know, swap your one kilo bar of silver, which is going to be a lot more 
you know, it's a lot more valuable than possibly the small item you might want to trade for. Or let's just say a more mundane example, um, you're using your precious metals as a savings account and, you know, you got a bill to pay, but it's relatively small, but you need some cash. Well, if all you've got are kilo bars, you're kind of relegated to selling a big piece of silver. Whereas if you've got some rounds, you can go down to your local coin shop or, uh, you know, your buddy who wants to buy some silver and you can swap some fiat in a smaller denomination or a smaller quantity for something like that. So I know uh, I haven't exhausted all the different types of bullion out there, but that's kind of a brief overview. And if you guys have any questions about any of this stuff, please do put it in the comments down below. And I know this is kind of rambly and all over there, but I'm just trying to drop as much information as I can in this video for anybody who is a new stacker. And this is all I think Good stuff to know before you go out and you start actually spending money on physical bullion. So the spot price, what is the spot price? Because that's what everybody gets all uh, wrapped up in when they talk about premiums. And it's important to note that the spot price is not actually the price of a one ounce piece of silver. The spot price is determined by a futures contract. It's Whatever futures contract on your uh, commodities exchange, like the COMEX, for example, a place where contracts for silver are traded, it's the forward month's contract with the most volume. So it's whichever one's getting traded the most, uh, you know, futures contract go out uh, one month, two months, three months, etc. And whichever one has the most trading activity, uh, that's how they determine the spot price of silver. It's whatever the price of that contract is. And those contracts typically represent... Uh, I believe 5,000 ounces of silver each, and they're traded on a digital exchange. It's, you know, digital silver, paper silver, what have you. And so uh, that stuff is obviously a little bit more liquid, like it's easier to trade hands than uh, physical metal. And as a result, it also trades at a discount to physical silver. So the premiums encompass that. That's the reason for the premium. So like, let's just say arbitrarily, I think today's spot price is around 22 bucks. I don't know if that's exact, but let's say it's 22 bucks. Well, yeah, if you go buy a 5,000 ounce futures contract on the COMEX, you're going to be paying that price, $22 an ounce. But if you go down to your local coin shop or you go over to SD Bullion and you want to buy a one ounce silver round, it's going to cost you more than $22 an ounce. Because for one thing, uh, a mint had to take that silver, you know, in those big COMEX bars and melt it down and actually produce these things. And obviously there's a cost to that. And also, you know, this stuff has to be distributed. It has to be warehoused, etc. And so uh, it's pretty interesting that the spot price really isn't the price of physical metal. It's a paper derivative of gold and silver. And that's why we have premiums. And the premiums, like I said, are going to be lower on larger products like, uh, you know, kilo bars, 100 ounce bars, and even lower if you want to actually go out into the market and buy a 1,000 ounce COMEX bar, for example, that's probably going to be the closest thing to the spot price that you can get. But then, of course, you know, you've got this gigantic uh, bar that if you drop it, it's going to, you know, break your foot. But anyway, oh, yeah, that's a, a brief tip. You know, I actually did drop this thing on my foot once, so I will tell you if you're a new stacker and you're handling heavy bars, wear closed-toed shoes because that hurt quite a bit. So there's a tip that might save you a toe. So the paper contract thing, that has a lot to do with the whole manipulation thing. You might hear people talking about precious metals manipulation. Now, for some reason, in the comments on these videos, people often reference that as a reason not to buy gold and silver. I view it a bit differently. Now, is there manipulation in those paper markets? Yeah, there definitely is. You know, the spot price is not the real price of physical metal. It's the price of a paper contract. And a lot more of those paper contracts get traded than actual underlying metal exists. This is an important thing to understand for anybody who's getting involved in the precious metals game. And it's a lot of the reason why we say in the stacking community, if you don't hold it, you don't own it. Now, let me give you some examples of why that saying holds true in regards to precious metals manipulation and that sort of thing. So I'll pull up the latest numbers from the COMEX here. Now, this is provided from MikeSay98 on Twitter. A uh, shout out to Mike. And definitely, if you're on Twitter, go give him a follow. And give me a follow, too, at Stack Smarter. This is the latest information from the COMEX in terms of how much silver they actually have on hand at this commodities exchange. So, 
The eligible silver that they've got, about 257 million ounces. Registered silver, 31 million ounces and change. Now, the registered is the stuff that's like immediately available for anybody who wants to take delivery. That is somebody who buys a paper futures contract and wants to actually get their hands on that physical metal. They want to take the delivery from the inventory at the COMEX. That equals out to about 288 million ounces, a little bit more than that. That's how much silver they actually have in their vault, supposedly, at the COMEX. Now, if you look at the open interest, that's the number of contracts that are outstanding. So 127,385, and each one of those represents about 5,000 ounces of physical silver. So those total contracts represent about 636 million ounces of silver. So they've got 288 million, but they have contracts outstanding for 636 million. So this kind of gives you an idea of the kind of game of musical chairs that they're playing at these commodities exchanges. Now, one of the reasons that folks like to have their hands on gold and silver in the first place is that they're a safe haven, you know, for disastrous events in the economy, a hyperinflation, war, bank failures, what have you. Uh, one of the nice things about gold and silver is they don't have any counterparty risk. So, you know, if you've got this in your hand, there's really nothing that anybody can do out there that can devalue this. It's not like a bank account where you could wake up one day and the bank says, oh, sorry, you know, we failed. We don't have the funds. Uh, we're going to bail in and take your deposits, um, or it's not like, uh, you know, you buy some shares in uh, China Mobile or something like that, and you wake up the next day and the president has put, you know, sanctions on Chinese companies, and so your asset is frozen, because those are, you know, things that have happened. Look at Cyprus, you know, they had bank bail-ins, and here in the U.S., uh, Chinese securities were frozen for a lot of shareholders, and uh, same thing if you owned, you know, Gazprom stock or something like that. Russian stocks following the Ukraine invasion, you know, those assets were frozen, but there's nothing that anybody can do. I mean, short of, I guess, banning the ownership of gold and silver, but even then, you know, they've got to manage the logistics of a confiscation or whatever. And I think that, you know, the logistics of that favor the stackers. The reason, like I'm saying, people own precious metals is to hedge against tail risk events, you know, major black swan events and stuff like that. And so, you know, Owning a paper silver contract when you know for a fact, according to their own numbers, that there's not enough physical metal at the exchange to back up those paper contracts, it's kind of a crazy thing. And, you know, as far as manipulation goes, having paper contracts out there that aren't actually backed up by physical metal and not 100%, it really leaves the door open to quite a bit of manipulation because if you're a bank and you have, you know, access to tremendous amounts of fiat currency that you can use to just open up naked short positions, you really can manipulate the price of precious metals. And there's been a lot of evidence of this. I mean, JP Morgan has had some traders convicted over the past couple of years. They've paid, I think, over a billion dollars in fines for spoofing the precious metals market. So there is manipulation out there. Now, to what extent it goes on, I have no idea. I mean, it's not really a transparent thing. Obviously, they're not doing it in a way that you can just, you know, Google it and find out, uh, or it's not visible in any accessible database or anything. But, you know, just know that manipulation does go on on these paper markets. But to me, that's a reason to be getting your hands on physical metal. Because, I mean, if they're using paper assets to artificially suppress the price of gold or silver, and that allows you to buy the physical metal at a discount to, you know, what would be, quote unquote, a fair market price... I'll do that all day I, because any kind of manipulation to that extent I think is ultimately unsustainable. And the fact that we're able to get an asset below its real fair value I think is you know a huge opportunity, a huge advantage. Okay, and speaking of reasons to own gold and silver, obviously the fact that you know if they're being suppressed and they're cheap, then that's a good reason to be getting into them. Also, you know, they're printing a lot of dollars today, folks. Gold and silver traditionally are a hedge against inflation. You will hear some people push back against that because, after all, we've had a lot of inflation here over the past couple of years in the U.S., and gold and silver, while they are higher than they were uh, in September, you know, they are still lower than they were in 2011. Uh, if you adjust the price for inflation, they're both well below that, and the all-time highs for silver, it's like 1980, silver hit 50 bucks in intraday trading. And if you adjust that for inflation, it's something like $170 uh, in today's currency. And so, you know, why haven't they kept up with inflation? Well, 
There's a lot of things at play there, but I do think that ultimately uh, gold and silver are going to prove to be effective inflation hedges in the long run. And the fact that they haven't risen drastically despite the level of inflation that we have, again, I view as an opportunity. I view it as a sign that gold and silver are undervalued at today's prices. And if you want to know if gold and silver are really inflation hedges, all you have to do is look at places where they're experiencing runaway inflation. You know, places like Turkey right now, for example, they have inflation, I believe their year over year rate is north of 80%. And gold and silver have both skyrocketed in terms of the Turkish lira. Or look at places like Zimbabwe or Venezuela. I mean, I personally have some family that went through the hyperinflation in Venezuela, and a lot of them were able to get by by selling precious metals that they had. Now, they weren't stackers. They didn't have coins or bars. They would have been a lot better off if they did, but they had some jewelry and stuff like that, and that was able to you know, get them through some of the worst times. In a lot of currencies around the world right now, gold and silver are putting in record highs. It's just in the U.S. dollar, we haven't seen that yet because the dollar is kind of strengthened as the Fed has been raising rates. If you want my take on it, inflation uh, is going to get worse and gold and silver will prove to be inflation hedges ultimately. And you know, one of the reasons that gold and silver are so undervalued at today's price is because there's kind of like this psychological war on gold and silver. Um, you're labeled as kind of a weirdo. I think if you want to get your hands on physical metal, that's sort of the mainstream take on things. You know, you're some uh, survivalist uh, living off grid in a bunker. Now I'm all about living off-grid in a bunker and all that, but it's not a prerequisite for stacking metals by any means. And, uh, you know, you see things like Ben Bernanke, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, when Ron Paul asked him in congressional testimony if he thought gold was money, uh, he denied it flatly. He said no, and then when Paul asked him why central banks stacked gold, he said it was just because of tradition. Now, obviously, Bernanke's not a fool. He knows that gold and silver are money, uh, at least I would assume he understands their role historically. But, you know, he's not trying to undermine the fiat game that the government and the central banks have going, you know, and it's kind of in his best interest to downplay the role of gold and silver because, you know, central bankers tend to not like gold too much. It's something that they can't print. So anyway, I am kind of rambling now about reasons to stack gold and silver, but I, I do think that inflation hedging is an important role in your portfolio that gold and silver can fulfill. And also, you know, the hedge against uh, systemic collapse, that sort of thing, uh, a way to protect yourself against bank bail-ins, bank failures, uh, potential cyber attacks, uh, takedown of the financial system. And we've seen lots of uh, glitches Lately, from Bank of America to the New York Stock Exchange to the FAA, a lot of people seem to be experiencing a lot of glitches these days, and who knows, one day you might wake up and find that your brokerage account or your bank has had a glitch, and you're just kind of out of luck. But the good thing about gold and silver, like I said, no counterparty risk, it's in your own custody, uh, nobody can make them worthless with the stroke of a pen or the touch of a keyboard, and there's not too many assets these days that you can say that for, so that is a good reason to get into gold and silver. Now, I'm sure that there are some things I didn't cover that were germane to new stackers in today's video. Again, this isn't meant to be a comprehensive guide. It's just like a broad, broad overview. Uh, some of the different types of bullion you can get, some of the reasons you might want to invest in silver and uh, clarifying some terminology. If you've got any questions about gold and silver and you're a new stacker, put them down in the comments. But before we wrap this up, I do want to give you some quick tips. Now, these are tips that I wish someone had shared with me before I got into stacking gold and silver. But I'm going to go ahead and just run through these for you real quick. So first of all, buy from a reputable place. You know, don't pick up gold and silver on Craigslist or eBay from small sellers or anything like that. Uh, maybe when you get a little more experienced and you understand how to spot counterfeits and that sort of thing, you could do that. You know, you can look for deals. But if you're new, just stick to reputable dealers. Now, SD Bullion is a channel sponsor. They're pretty much where I buy all of my gold and silver. So I feel very comfortable sending you to them. There is a link down in the description. And if you are new and you've never bought from them before, go to sdbullion.com slash new, and they have some offers where you can actually get some gold and silver at spot. Next tip is uh, don't just shop in one place. You know, I do think you should check out SD Bullion. That's where I shop. But also, you know, check out all the other places, all the other online dealers, reputable ones. Uh, they all have better business bureau pages. You can find the 
reputable ones pretty easily. Check out your local coin shop, definitely if you have one, um, go in there and chat them up and just familiarize yourself with the market. I mean, look, if you don't want to do that, go to SD Bullion. You're not going to get ripped off there. They have good customer service. They have excellent pricing. Uh, do they always have the absolute lowest price on every single piece of bullion? Well, no, I don't think that anybody has that. That would be impossible. But if you go to their deals page, you're always going to find some really excellent deals. And I will say that they always consistently have the lowest price on something. You know, I think right now they've got uh, Scottsdale Mint stuff on sale, which is amazing. I mean, if you guys have been watching for a while, you know I love Scottsdale Silver. I've got a lot of their uh, bars and rounds and stuff like that. And um, they've got those on sale right now. Okay, next up is when you buy your gold and silver, track what you're doing. Start a spreadsheet in Excel or Google Sheets or whatever and track what you are buying. This will make your stacking journey a lot easier if you do this from the beginning. Put in, you know, whatever data you think is relevant. It definitely include like where you got the stuff, the date, how much you paid per ounce, the total price, all that stuff because you'll find that once you get doing this for a while, you're going to kind of lose track of things. And you might also, in that uh, spreadsheet, you might want to include like a picture or a link to a picture of the specific product and probably a copy of your receipt. And when you go to sell, that's going to make your life a lot easier because you're going to be able to determine, you know, what your cost was. And, you know, none of this is tax advice or financial advice or anything, but knowing your cost basis on an asset like gold and silver is going to be very helpful when you go to sell it for tax purposes because you will need to pay capital gains tax and, uh, you know, just keeping track of all of that information in one place will make your life a lot easier. The other thing I will say is plan your purchases. You know, don't just go out and compulsively buy some stuff. Like, have a strategy. Have an idea of when you might sell your gold and silver. What is your actual objective? You know, are you looking for capital appreciation? Are you looking for an emergency fund in precious metals? Do you want an inflation hedge asset? Do you just think that gold and silver, based on your analysis, are undervalued? Think about all this stuff. Have a plan in place before you go out and shop. And then the other thing I will say is don't use leverage to buy precious metals. Don't go out and, you know, use a credit card or any kind of debt to buy precious metals because, you know, if the market doesn't move the way that you like, you could end up being forced to liquidate your metals at a bad time. I mean, you want to be a strong hand. And to that note, you know, don't go all in on precious metals at one time either. Uh, you always want to have some cash on hand because what happens if you spend all your cash on, you know, a silver bar, you do pay a bit of a premium on it. And then the next day uh, you get an unexpected expense. Now you got to go liquidate that bar. You're going to lose the premium. Uh, you know, gold and silver are not the sort of thing you want to be moving in and out of. They're a very long-term holding. And so, uh, you know, always make sure that you have some cash in, on hand. Don't put yourself in a position where you're going to need to liquidate your precious metals to pay for an emergency. Now, I mean, if you absolutely have to, that's part of the reason that we have things like gold and silver. But uh, don't go all in, is my point. I don't think it's wise to do that. And also, one of the reasons you don't want to go all in is... You know, if you go all in and then the market drops, well, you can't take advantage of the lower pricing. I mean, my approach has always been to make regular, small, incremental purchases, and I try to buy on days when the precious metals are going down. Now, we have recently had a bit of a pullback. Uh, silver was up over 24 bucks. Now it's around 22 So, I mean, I do view this as probably a good time to get into the market if you're looking to. And certainly by any historical standards, gold and silver are both very undervalued, I think. Just don't go all in at once. Make your purchases incrementally, and I think that that will serve you well. Now, this video has gone on uh, longer than I anticipated, but you know, once you start talking about this stuff, you can kind of go on for a long time if you are a stacker like me and you really like stacking. Uh, but again, if you have any questions or anything, please leave me a comment down below and I will be happy to do my best to answer that for you. And I do just want to say a big thank you to everybody for watching. If you're a new stacker, welcome to Team Hard Money. I mean, this is an awesome hobby. It's an awesome way to save some real money. And who knows, uh, in the event of an economic catastrophe, we talk about that a lot on this channel, uh, this stuff might end up being a lifesaver. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. Thanks for watching, everybody. Stay safe and happy stacking, and I will catch you next time. Smart Silver Stacker, out.